Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to Sapru House to the lecture on the outlook for India-Sri Lanka relations after the presidential elections in Sri Lanka by Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja, Executive Director, Lakshman Kadirgama Institute, Colombo, Sri Lanka. The program would begin with remarks by Chair Ambassador Ashok Kekanta, Director, Institute for Chinese Studies, New Delhi, okay. and former High Commissioner of India to Sri Lanka. This would be followed by the lecture by Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja. At the end, there will be Q&A, and closing remarks will be given by the Chair. I may now request Ambassador Ashok Kekanta to give your remarks and conduct the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ambassador T.C. Raghavan, uh, High Commissioner Austin Fernando, uh, Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja, and all friends present here. I know it's, it's as we were just discussing in uh, Dr. Raghavan's office, uh, this lecture by eminent scholar Dr. Ganesh Vignaraja is extremely timely. It's become more so now, you know, after recent developments in Sri Lanka and visit of President Gotabaya Rajpaksha to India. As you know, uh, Dr. Vignaraja is uh, executive director of Lakshman Khadir Kamar Institute in Colombo, which is affiliated to Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka. Prior to joining uh, this institute, uh, he has held senior positions in international organizations and in the private sector. He has worked with the Commonwealth Secretariat, the OECD, Oxford University, the Overseas Development Institute, and United Nations. Uh, he is a you know, very erudite and prolific uh, writer with 19 books and monographs to his credit. I was checking out on the LKI website. Welcome to you, Dr. Vignaraja. Now, today he'll be talking about uh, the outlook for India-Sri Lanka relations after presidential elections in Sri Lanka. As you know, these elections got over barely well, less than three weeks ago. President Gotabaya Rajpaksha emerged victorious in, in the campaign with a very clear margin of more than 10 percentage points, was um, sewn in on 18th November. And during this period, last couple of weeks, we have seen hectic activities in India-Sri Lanka relations as well, with uh, our external affairs minister, Dr. Jashankar, visiting Colombo a day after the new president was sewn in as Prime Minister Modi's special emissary inviting uh, President uh, Gotabaya Rajpaksha to visit India, an invitation which was accepted immediately, and we had the new president in New Delhi just last week. By all accounts, uh, it was a very productive visit, which uh, involved uh, the two leaders, uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Rajpaksha, giving assurances to each other about importance attached to this critical relationship. Uh, Prime Minister Modi describing uh, India as Sri Lanka's closest maritime neighbor. Two sides talking about uh, security and developmental interests being uh, inseparable. Prime Minister Modi announcing a new line of credit for Sri Lanka and a whole lot of other developments taking place. Uh, Clearly, the two visits, uh, first of uh, Dr. Jashankar to Colombo and then of President Gotabaya Rajpaksha to India, signify a lot. They underline the importance the two countries attached to each other and also the fact that the relationship remains sound and there's desire on both sides to strengthen it further. At the same time, you know, we are aware of some concerns in certain quarters in India about uh, implications of recent political developments in Sri Lanka. Before I invite um, Dr. Vignaraja to deliver his lecture, I would like to make three broad observations. Um, 
The first point I would like to make is that these concerns are overblown. President Gotabaya Rajpaksha and his new Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajpaksha, are people we have worked very closely with in the past. They are known quantities for us. We have done business with them and I am sure we will continue to do business with them in future as well. President Gotabaya is known for his direct approach. Someone who delivers on commitments he makes, but someone who also speaks his mind. I believe this approach, Defence Secretary, I remember the issues ranging from the thorny fishermen's uh, uh, detention concerns to developmental partnership, where one could go to him, seek his intervention, and get things moving. So for this is the first point I would like to highlight that he's a person we can do business with. Second point I would like to make that uh, strengths and synergies in India-Sri Lanka relations are at times underestimated. What Prime Minister mentioned last week after his meeting with uh, President Rajpaksha that uh, in India, Sri Lanka has its closest maritime neighbor is a truism. No, it's a fact that we are not only geographically close to each other, but uh, the extensive you know, linkages and synergies bringing two countries together are uh, both security concerns and developmental interests are closely aligned. It's extremely important for us not to fall prey to this temptation in certain quarters to label people as pro-India or anti-India or pro-China or anti-China. I think such a facile you know, characterization is often off the mark. For us in Sri Lanka, it has been a sensible policy to engage with all and we have found that all our interlocutors are equally interested in engaging with us. Third point I would like to make before I invite Dr. Vigna Raja to deliver his lecture is that uh, while uh, we have uh, an extremely close relationship with Sri Lanka, it's also a fact that there are a host of sensitive and complex issues in the relationship which requires careful handling all the time. These challenges range from the ethnic question in Sri Lanka, China's growing footprint in the country, the fishermen's issue, counter-terrorism, extremism and other security challenges, as also opportunities and anxieties linked to trade investment relationship between India and Sri Lanka. These are tricky issues with two sides having differing perspectives and it always requires a great deal of dexterity on both sides to navigate in these somewhat choppy waters. I'll just give you a couple of examples here very quickly. One on the ethnic issue. Following uh, Dr. Jashankar's uh, visit to Colombo on 19th of last month, uh, a message was put out by Ministry of External Affairs that uh, it's our expectation the Sri Lankan government will take forward the process of national reconciliation to arrive at a solution that meets the aspirations of the Tamil community for equality, justice, peace and dignity. I'm sure a similar message was conveyed by Prime Minister Modi to President Gotapaya Rajpaksha during the meeting on 29th November. But President Rajpaksha also has made it clear in his public comments, including the interview he gave to the Hindu, that for him the priority will be development in the North and the East rather than political devolution. And that on the issue of reconciliation or devolution, he'll be extremely mindful of the sentiments of the majority community, the Sinhalese community. He doesn't make any bones about it. He's a direct upfront person and he stated that publicly. 
Likewise, on the other sensitive issue of Chinese presence and activities and the growing profile in Sri Lanka, while he did convey that he'll be mindful of India's security concerns, no assurance is held out as far as engagement with China, Sri Lanka's engagement with China is concerned. I'm sure Dr. Ganesh Rignaraja will be talking about these issues which are very relevant, which are of great interest to the audience present here. So I'll now invite Dr. Vignaraja to deliver his lecture. Over to you, Dr. Vignaraja. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kanta. It's a real pleasure to be here at the ICWA. And I'd like to thank uh, the DG, uh, TCA Raghavan, for very kindly having me here. And also to the India Sri Lanka Foundation. And we have High Commissioner Austin Fernando here from Sri Lanka, as well as, of course, the Indian High Commissioner in Sri Lanka, uh, Taranjit Singh, who were very generous in providing a small grant for me to travel here. Um, and also very uh, grateful to Samata for uh, excellent logistics. Um, I'll start this talk by simply saying that improved India-Sri Lanka relations um, can have a positive outcome for both parties, but particularly for Sri Lanka, uh, being the smaller economy in this relationship, um, but can also potentially be a pathway to improve regional integration in South Asia. So that's kind of the starting point for what I want to say. And I just want to make three caveats uh, also right up front. The first is I'm speaking here in my personal capacity as an academic. I, I don't represent the government of Sri Lanka. Um, the views I give here should not even be attributed to my institute. Uh, second, this lecture uh, was arranged be between ICWA and, and ourselves um, several months ago, well before the high-profile visit last week. Uh, so there isn't that linkage either, but it is fortunate that all of you have come today, uh, and, and we are lucky to have this interaction uh, on this interesting issue. Um, and last, that this is a kind of a work in progress as I sort of clear my mind and read the literature and think of these issues in a particular lens. Um, and, and it's sort of work that, uh, you know, uh, one, one is trying to understand really this uh, dynamic between a, a regional power uh, like India, uh, which is an important global player today, and Sri Lanka as a small open economy, uh, which has become upper middle income and is hoping to sort of take off, right? So that's, that's the kind of interesting dynamic I want to try to give you. Um, in terms of the uh, material, uh, Samata? Something, something's gone wrong with the PowerPoint. Um, ah, yeah. Okay. So the backdrop is, is, is fairly clear. Uh, we have this possibility of a new era for India, Sri Lanka. And the chair talked about uh, some of the events uh, that are there. And the most important issue, perhaps, was the talks last week. Um, the statements from President Rajapaksa and the party, the SLPP, that he uh, is in charge of, talk about a new priority for Sri Lanka. So he has at least four things. One is uh, political stability and a better security for Sri Lankans. Uh, economic development is a second important objective, particularly this transition to high income status from upper middle income. And I think they talk about a 6% growth rate um, in Sri Lanka. We are something like 3% or thereabouts today. So this is a big sea change that he envisages. He also talks about more efficient state institutions. For some time now, Sri Lanka has had four or five important loss-making enterprises from Sri Lankan Airlines to the Electricity Board to others. He wishes to try to turn these around uh, with new management and new practices and a strong emphasis on better governance in those institutions. And fourthly, there is this important plank of a non-aligned or reaffirmation to a non-aligned foreign policy uh, with a deep respect for Sri Lankan sovereignty and making decisions in the national interest. Um, the backdrop was an interesting one for the electoral story. Uh, you had peaceful elections, uh, a very high turnout, um, and quite a large majority, um, one million plus margin uh, for President Gotabaya. Um, but there was some geographical concentration of this vote. Um, that needs to be looked at, uh, presumably, down the line. Um, the early signs of, of 
of what has happened in the rollout of government is an interim government. Uh, you have a cabinet of 16, uh, which is dramatically down from a cabinet of around 40 uh, that was there during the coalition. And during the earlier period, they you know, split subjects in a manner that would not be totally rational. Um, today, you have a more scientific approach to some of this. Um, you also have this interesting uh, uh, thing where he has emphasized the national emblem being there in state institutions, no photographs of personalities, including himself. Um, and so this kind of gives us the beginnings of a new um, change in Sri Lanka. Today, what I'm going to talk about is the high-level talk setting the stage for upgraded relationship between India and Sri Lanka within the national policies and interests of both countries. Um, and the spotlight I'm going to try to put on this is really recalibration of this relationship, not in isolation um, on a caterous Paris basis, but rather in this more challenging international environment that both countries are finding themselves. Um, since the global financial crisis, um, with much more complicated geopolitics than before. Um, so this era um, means different things for this relationship in the future. I'm going to try to give you a storyline from the perspective of an economist, which I am, but because I run a security studies international relations think tank, I'm going to divulge a little bit into uh, those perspectives as well. And there are kind of three questions that I want to try to use today to sort of set the scene. The first is, what is the record of India-Sri Lanka relations, particularly since the end of the conflict in Sri Lanka, since 2010, so the last decade or so? Um, and I'm going to try to look at trade, investment, foreign aid, and a bit on the security relationship. Second, I'm going to try to look at some of these emerging challenges um, that both countries may face in this new global era, and talk a little bit about what it might mean for the relationship between them. Last, I'm going to try to lay out some of these issues that might be there in the relationship going forward and some of the easy wins, particularly on the economic front perhaps, but also some of the legacy issues which kind of cloud over this relationship in, in, in the past, but, but are there to be dealt with as the relationship matures and moves to a different stage. So let me start with a kind of a bilan, or stock take as the French would call it. Um, and I'm going to try to look a bit at these economic issues uh, with a tinge of some of the security issues. Um, the first issue is of the trade relationship. The total trade today is some $4.8 billion, and that is up from $3 billion about a decade ago. Now, when you look at this graph, um, you see the important issue, which is there is this trade imbalance um, from the Sri Lankan perspective. And it's something like a $3 billion deficit. Now, that's not much in the Indian context if you take India's total trade. But for Sri Lanka, it matters. Um, our trade, depending on how you measure it, is $11 billion or $20 billion if you bring in the services. So this is quite a big number for us. Um, we have a larger deficit with China um, than with India. Um, but these are important issues for us. Now, the trade deficit per se, if you take a mercantilist approach, you know, people get very upset about trade deficits. I per se don't worry about it, but I worry about the foreign exchange implications. So it's something we have to take into account because trade deficits have to be financed. And Sri Lanka has not only a balance of payments deficit, but also a budget deficit. So twin deficits means your econo economy has some weaknesses there. This, this deficit with India reflects, um, you know, weaknesses in Sri Lanka's supply capacity. Uh, particularly our export side. Our export basket is very concentrated in commodities and also textiles. We have not made that jump into medium tech um, issues like auto parts or electronics. Um, so Sri Lanka has a particularly um, kind of focused export base. Um, a second important issue which is increasingly becoming apparent to me at least is that our knowledge of the Indian market, particularly the domestic regulations, is not very good. Um, particularly at the level of the states. You know, you have this center state set of issues in regulations, and our exporters are not as knowledgeable as we should be about these things. A third issue which also clouds this trade deficit is the perception, at least among Sri Lankan exporters, that there are these non-tariff measures on the Indian side, uh, particularly customs regulations and phytosanitary standards. Now, some of this is um, maybe real, 
Some of this may be legacy of, of outdated laws, and this also exists on the Sri Lankan side. Uh, some of the SPS TBT rules go back to British times indeed, and some of the customs regulations also need overhauling and go there. Um, and then there is the fourth issue, which is India is a much more advanced industrial economy than Sri Lanka. Um, and you have you know, a deep auto sector uh, with a strong auto parts cluster in South India, for instance, and you have electronics cluster that you have uh, begun to be part of um, in the manufacturing side, uh, but particularly in the services side, uh, where you are a major exporter of ICT goods to the world. Um, um, and this partly explains the issue. Now, the solution is partly export-oriented foreign investment from India into the manufacturing sector in Sri Lanka, uh, but also a lot of focused export promotion from the Sri Lankan side uh, at the firm level, um, which one needs to understand the Indian market better. It means better technological capacity, better marketing capacity of Sri Lankan firms, but also more targeted promotion by our export development board in Sri Lanka to the Indian market. And working together maybe um, to understand the realistic nature of the Indian non-tariff measures, if these exist, uh, or are these own overhang of old regulations that need reform and we need to understand better so that we can meet Indian standards in key industries. So there is an interesting set of issues there um, and certainly upgrading Sri Lankan standards um, at least to understand better the standards in India plus more global standards also remains a very important issue and of course there's customs regulations. So that's one very important area we've got to deal with. Now, part of the solution is this export-oriented foreign investment, particularly in the manufacturing sector. When you break this number down, um, between 2003 to today, you have some $1 billion worth of Indian FDI that has come to Sri Lanka. That's not very much uh, when you look at India's outward investment elsewhere, right? So it's a small number. Um, if you bring it down to the last few years, uh, it's some $600-odd million, which again is very small. Um, just for your interest, China has invested some $12 billion in Sri Lanka during this period. So this gives you an idea of, you know, um, different players in Sri Lanka. The U.S. has invested um, a much smaller amount, much less than a billion. Um, so it gives you a sense of, uh, you know, the scale of some of these things. Now, why is Indian investment small to Sri Lanka? You know, part of this is the perception on the Indian side of Sri Lanka being a small market. And indeed, it's only 21 point something million people, uh, a city the size of Mumbai, maybe, uh, if the comparison is right. Um, so it's not much of a small internal market, right? Um, and there is a goods FTA, uh, so it's not that well linked to, F to India. So and this goods FTA is partial, of course. Um, a second important aspect which clouds overall FDI into Sri Lanka is the investor perception of Sri Lanka not being the most business friendly place in the world. And this is borne out from the World Bank's doing business indicators, which Sri Lanka climbed one rank to 99th from 100 um, in 2020, uh, according to these surveys that are done, and those are done on a whole bunch of things. India's ranking, as you all know, has jumped a lot. India is 63rd, and Pakistan also has jumped a lot. So um, there is this perception which is partly verified by the data in Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka's gap. Um, means we have to do a lot of work on the behind the border regulations. We have to deal with um, our clearance of uh, courts uh, cases, uh, our judicial disputes um, issue is there. Contract enforcement is a challenge according to the World Bank survey. Uh, tax administration is another challenge. And there are labor regulations amongst issues that we have to do. If you're a small country, there is little doubt that you have to be the most business friendly place in the world if you want to encourage foreign investment. And that's, you know, really a critical issue um, in large country, small country dynamics. And an FTA, uh, which is upgraded, is another very important condition if you can get it. Um, so, so there is homework on the Sri Lankan side if we want to get uh, investment up uh, to scale. Um, a third area which is very interesting is about trade agreements. Um, and currently trade potentially is governed by three rather limited agreements. You have the South Asian Free Trade Agreement, uh, which does a bit of goods. You have the Asia-Pacific Trade Agreement, um, and you have the Indo-Sri Lanka FTA. I think of those, it's the bilateral that is used somewhat. Um, and the ECTA uh, has been under discussion for some time. The upgraded agreement, which tries to bring in services, 
uh, it has stalled uh, in spite of several uh, discussions. And there are two other potential routes, uh, the BIMSTEC FTA and then there is the RCEP, uh, which has been in the news in India recently. Uh, and I think the latest statement is that India um, may not want to do the RCEP. And so there is some discussion in ASEAN about um, the X minus one formula uh, storyline. From the point of view of India, Sri Lanka, um, I look, I look at this thing uh, very much as based on country size and industrial capacity. And for me, at the end of the day, um, I think this is something India should look at very closely to thinking with Sri Lanka with this new relationship of thinking about everything but arms. Now, this may sound like a fanciful proposal uh, from the Indian side, but it could well result in the kind of Indi Indian integration with Sri Lanka uh, that a small country which is non-threatening uh, to a large economy like India, given its scale and scope, uh, should enjoy and perhaps may deal also with the geopolitical issues that you may think of. And this is the one big offer that India could make. And there are some adjustment issues. There are a few firms in South India that worry about Sri Lankan textile exports to India. But look, this is small beer. Our wages are $1.07 an hour. Indian wages are less. Um, these companies from Sri Lanka are already in Bangladesh and very globally integrated elsewhere. And I, I think the EBA approach would be the right way to go about it. And I'm happy to talk about it in the chat. This is not something India should fear. Um, the second interesting thing about the FTA storyline, and again we can come back to this in this chat, is the links with East Asia. We have the possibility of a BIMSTEC FTA, but that has been going on since 2004, if my memory serves me right. There have been multiple uh, discussions and really no movement very much. The template is, is far less than even that of the India-Sri Lanka FTA on the good side. So it's a very weak agreement. I think there needs to be a big push on that. And eventually the RCEP will come into play. Um, and I think the RCEP will be very useful if the right safeguards are there. And one can perhaps use anti-dumping rules if one worries too much about Chinese um, imports into India. Um, and certainly standards are also there as, as a possibility. For the Sri Lankan case, the RCEP offers a wonderful route to get multiple FTA storyline with one single agreement. You know, we negotiate an agreement with Singapore, which may be looked at again by the new Rajapaksa administration because of some complaints from service providers in Sri Lanka. But rather than trying to negotiate 16 agreements with all the ASEAN countries, we could get this in one shot. And India may be a very important route for us uh, to go through East Asia through the RCEP. So this is a very interesting dynamic we are in. Uh, but of course, India would have to make up its own mind about the RCEP. And we, we've had a uh, storyline there uh, in the last few days. Development aid, um, Sri Lanka is a major recipient of Indian aid. From what I understand, uh, there have been cumulative commitments of some $3 billion, uh, including $560 million in grants uh, since, 20, uh, since 2005. And Indian aid has played an important role in humanitarian uh, and post-conflict development in Sri Lanka. Uh, the tsunami storyline is very uh, well known. Um, and more recently, you have a major housing project um, which is a flagship project. There have been a 1,000 homes constructed. Um, and also, there's been a Reserve Bank a bilateral swap. The one that I like a lot is the ambulance service, which I think has been a wonderful um, gift from India to Sri Lanka. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, um, but this is fantastic. You know, India has, um, sorry, Sri Lanka has a public health service, uh, very much like a national health service, uh, free at the point of entry. The problem used to be getting people to the hospital. Um, and India's gift um, was two grants of about 20 odd million dollars. Um, and they provided uh, Tata ambulances amongst the uh, stock of uh, ambulances that came. There was some training. Um, and also there was some money given for the first year of operation. And this has resulted in an island-wide service uh, with a 12 million response time on average um, and some 20,000 lives according to the stats that are there. Uh, have been saved because of this. Um, and it's a very impressive model. I, I think the Indian uh, aid should consider packaging this and offering it to other South Asian countries, but also to Africa. It's a, it's a very impressive scheme and perhaps undervalued in the Indian aid program. Um, and something you all should study very carefully of the Sri Lankan experience. It's a wonderful case study. Um, now, the, the issue for me in Indian aid really um, is that 
as Sri Lanka is now an upper middle income country, I think while the aid is very valued for us, given that we don't get much granted, um, it should really be more about trade and investment for Sri Lanka and moving away from the grant-based aid. And I think that should really be the new focus of Indian assistance to Sri Lanka in the most sense. And I think eventually some of these central bank arrangements and bilateral swaps and other things will also come. So it will be a more um, relationship related to the level of income of Sri Lanka. And I think the post-conflict humanitarian phase should come to an end and we should move to a new relationship even on development assistance as we move go forward. And it may take some time uh, in the adjustment process. Security cooperation is another very important area and India has played a major role in helping Sri Lanka, which is an island nation after all, uh, dealing with um, this maritime domain. And in particular, India has been very important in helping Sri Lanka to build a fleet of offshore patrol vessels, which are critically important to deal with this issue of drugs, uh, which are a big challenge in the Indian Ocean now. Um, some 18% of global drugs trade um, incidents, sorry, uh, incidents of, of, of uh, capturing these drugs on the high seas happens in the Indian Ocean now. And those are from 6% a few years ago. So this um, capture of these drugs um, by coast guards and navies uh, is a very important issue. Um, there's been a lot of training, of course. Um, some 800 military personnel come every year. Um, and India was very important in providing us with assistance uh, post the Easter attacks, uh, as well as others uh, that came, including the FBI and so on. So this relationship so far on the economic front is important, but a kind of a glass half full. And, and as an economist, for me, um, one would like to see a much greater expansion on uh, the trade and investment side, um, as well as a heightened level of cooperation on the security side, but particularly intelligence and also in the maritime domain. Let me now briefly mention some of these mega trends uh, that may affect India-Sri Lanka relations as we think about things going forward. And what I'm going to show you are based on two major studies that I've been involved in. Uh, one is a study of the future of Asia, uh, which was done for the Overseas Development Institute which, in London, which I'm also a senior research associate and that's downloadable from the internet. Uh, and the second is uh, work that my institute does on the Indian Ocean economy. And I'm just going to show you some uh, quick slides which talk about the new context uh, faced by India and Sri Lanka, just to whet your appetite for what might be the agenda as we look at the future relationship. The first important mega trend um, is this shift to a new era. And if you think about the old era before the global financial crisis was one where global trade, global investment, global technology flows, and so on, were integrating at a much faster pace. There was this era of so-called hyper-globalization that countries talked about. Since the global financial crisis, all of these have now come down significantly. And the best way of capturing this storyline and what it means for India and Sri Lanka is something called the trade growth elasticity. This is essentially the rate at which trade growth powers GDP growth. And the magical number before the crisis used to be something like two. So trade grew twice as fast as GDP growth uh, in this hyper-globalization phase. When you look at the numbers across Asia, that ratio has halved, right? And that's similar to what's happening globally. And a lot of that is linked to what's happening in China. And the rate of growth with China is decelerating much, much faster than expected. When you look at the Indian numbers, you see a similar deceleration of this rate. So trade per se potentially may power growth uh, less than before. And so there's much more emphasis on internal demand and domestic and regional demand. For Sri Lanka, it's a stable ratio. Uh, and as we might reform uh, to the Rajapaksa national development strategy approach, uh, our export sector may pick up a bit as well as our growth. But the ratios may not change fundamentally unless we really create a very export competitive model of growth uh, down the line. Um, now, the causes of all of this are weak international demand, of course, the trade tensions, uh, particularly US-China, um, and investor risk aversion with emerging markets. The solution really to all of this is much more regional integration in South Asia and an enhanced India-Sri Lanka relationship. So this particular factor has a really key implication for regionalism in South Asia. A second issue which is linked to this is slower growth. And this chart gives you the growth rates, broadly speaking in Asia, and a lot of this is linked to the China slowdown in the Asian number. The Indian number is an interesting one, and 
you know, if you pick up the newspapers here, there's a lot of talk about the number being mismeasured. Uh, some economists questioning where is Indian growth coming from. Uh, some people saying the number is lower, 6% and so on. Um, for Sri Lanka, we've had 3% growth. Uh, they rebased the number, so there's a measurement issue and there are some issues of the index that are being used and the surveys in which we uh, used to capture some of the indicators that go into this. Um, but we may well have an uptick in our growth. Um, so market access to India and more export oriented FDI for Sri Lanka are very important as part of this relationship. Again, giving you a, a sense of some of the dynamics that are playing out uh, in the way in which we look at this. And again, you can find all of this in the study uh, on the ODI website, uh, which is this thing, Tanky London. I'm going to show you the references in a minute. Another interesting dynamic in our relationship is population aging. Um, the colorful graph in the blue and reds, I think, are very instructive. Um, Sri Lanka is following a classic East Asian pattern of aging. We, we, we have this unusual story where the rest of South Asia has this demographic dividend which is shifting towards the youthful population. Sri Lanka is aging rather fast. Um, and this means, you know, extra costs of health care, um, extra costs of social care. Um, India has this demographic dividend, right? So the implication for me is something that um, I will show you a picture in a while, which is this port city that Sri Lanka is building, which is trying to extend the CEBD out into the sea through reclaiming land uh, through Chinese investment. And, you know, are Indian investors going to be an important part of that solution as we develop the port city into a multi-purpose service hub? Uh, because our population is aging and we don't have the young people potentially to work in the port city. If you take the extreme limit of an aging population, uh, in a country like Japan, uh, which is aging even faster, or Korea, uh, then there is an interesting issue for, for India there, and the, it has issues for our labor market in Sri Lanka, unless we do something about our birth rate, of course, uh, and our fertility rates, which are also challenging. So there are some very interesting issues when you start putting this strategic picture together. Another important issue is this middle-income Asia, um, and if you recall, um, at the current rates of growth and of per capita income um, much of Asia by 2025 is going to be middle income. Only a couple of countries, Nepal and Afghanistan, will be low income. Um, Sri Lanka has become an upper middle income country. Our per capita income is $4,102. Uh, we're at the fag end, if you like, of the middle income group. Some people say that's a statistical artifact, but anyway, we've made that transition. Uh, India is still, you know, uh, the lower middle income category. Um, when you look at the numbers going forward, again, depending on how you measure it, India will be uh, potentially upper middle income um, at the top end by in purchasing power parity terms. Uh, for Sri Lanka, um, we may potentially reach the higher income band or not, uh, again, depending on how we manage our growth transitions. Um, whatever you believe on the per capita basis and the numbers, um, this bit is one of the issues we worry about is East Sri Lanka mired in this middle income trap. Now, if you remember, this is a theoretical situation where a country that attains a certain level of income essentially gets stuck at that level, right? So in the Sri Lankan case, it has got to upper middle income after 14 years of staying at the low middle income part. But there is this risk that as labor and capital run out and certainly total factor productivity, Sri Lanka stays at this upper middle income uh, thing for a long period, perhaps even as much as 25 years unless we make the next stage of our transition. Um, and that could come with rising inequality. The latest statistics from the central bank suggest that if you look at the Gini coefficients, there is some rising income inequality uh, in Sri Lanka linked to various factors that you might get. Uh, urbanization is an important factor uh, linked to that income inequality rise uh, with a strong urban bias in our development strategy based on cities as well as big projects. Um, and the rural sector and agriculture has been somewhat neglected. So the implication is partly Indian assistance looking at the rural economy, uh, if that is the route that one goes to, and a lot more Indian skill training also looking at things like agriculture and rural employment and areas like that which become important. And the Trincomalee um, corridor that has Indian investment as, as Japan and India becomes also a very important project uh, in that kind of storyline. Um, in terms of developing out-of-town development in India may also or has been some talk of being involved in, in the south in Sri Lanka at Matale Airport uh, as well as some other potential projects. Um, so 
these developments have important implications. The last mega trend I want to bring you is this maritime domain. You know, the Indian Ocean, as, as you may well know, um, is really the unexploited potential um, region in the world and could potentially grow at some 6% a year, uh, largely linked to India's uh, growth momentum. But it's also a very important area in terms of you know, global fish capture. Some 30% um, of the world fish capture is there. Uh, so much of the world's water, so much of the world's iron and minerals. So it's a very important frontier area. However, while this potential may be there, um, there is a challenge of rising maritime security threats. Um, we have the traditional threats. Uh, there are something like 160 warships of a certain size in this group region, uh, which is a major worry. Um, and we worry very much in Sri Lanka about a South China Sea type scenario, right, where you have skirmishes at sea between large ships uh, within 100 yards of each other. That was a phenomenon. You have the floating island phenomenon. Uh, you have also the non-traditional threats. Maritime terrorism is an important issue. Uh, we have illegal and unreported fishing, uh, which is challenging. Uh, and we also have, um, you know, drugs uh, trade, which is happening increasingly through the Indian Ocean. Uh, so India and Sri Lanka have a very important area to cooperate, particularly in this maritime domain, uh, as the chair had also said. Uh, there are the security issues. There are also humanitarian and disaster relief. I believe it's right that India and Australia with um, <coughs> others play a very important role in the Indian Ocean in, in, in doing what they call HADR, uh, which is a very important area, search and rescue at sea. Um, and this becomes another very important dimension of the cooperation um, of both countries. Um, let me mention an area that is often talked about in the press, and this is um, the, the narrative that you read um, in the New York Times as well as elsewhere that Sri Lanka is portrayed as uh, being part of a Chinese debt trap, particularly around this Hambantota port project. Um, you know, this debt trap is simply not true related to Hambantota. The reason it's simply not true is that the debt that we owe China is not as significant as people make out. And my institute, along with Chatham House, are doing a major study on Chinese investment in Sri Lanka, and we will shortly release the report with the very detailed statistics on the debt issue. Now, what is true is that some projects in the portfolio have not been performing as well as others, uh, but this is not a systemic risk which the narrative of the debt trap claims to claim. The Humbant the Port project is essentially a commercial venture and related to a region that was underdeveloped in southern Sri Lanka, and this large port was seen as a mechanism to kickstart a kind of infrastructure-led development model. Um, the project was perhaps somewhat ambitious and not linked sufficiently to the rest of the economy in Sri Lanka. So if there was a gap, that's perhaps it as a development banker, that's my sort of take on it, um, and should have been captured within a 20, 25 year timeline. Because that's what it would take to do this kind of mega infrastructure project. Um, there was a deal uh, that was struck with China to renegotiate this, and they brought in um, a better port operator, China Merchant Ports, which is the largest state-owned enterprise in China, um, and probably the most efficient. It runs ports in Darwin, it runs ports in the United States and elsewhere, uh, which are profitable. Uh, the, the most recent uh, story from Sri Lanka on the port is that the government wants to renegotiate this deal, and China and Sri Lanka discussed this a few days ago, and um, I understand that there is a uh, sort of a view that they will negotiate this, but not harming the traditional friendship. The signs of Hambantota re-turning around are there. Um, you're seeing improved efficiency at the level of the port uh, with this new operator. Uh, and a fully operational Hambantota port may double Sri Lanka's port capacity. As you may know, Colombo port is one of the most efficient ports in Asia, according to Drury's Index. And transshipment trade is a major hub for Sri Lanka. Um, Hambantota coming online may well double that port capacity, and that's very important given India's Sagamala initiative. And the question for us is how do we make Sagamala and the initiatives in Sri Lanka complementary rather than competitive? And I think in a differentiated value chain type world, that's well possible um, that you can get complementarities which outweigh the competitiveness part of this. And the difference in Sri Lanka with Hambantota will be the industrial zone. You know, the port per se is a minor part of such a storyline. 
the industrial zone will be important and one hopes that it will be an open industrial zone where any investment can come um, and will make a difference to certain kinds of uh, production. Um, and Chinese investment in this storyline along with that others could well be an important stake and I think you know, President Rajapaksa made it very clear, we are inviting investment from all over the world to come into Sri Lanka and make some of these projects a success. And here's an interesting opportunity to be looked at um, and will facilitate the kind of integration that we might get. Let me just come to the last bit, which is about uh, enhancing Sri Lanka-India relations and what are some of the interesting issues. The chair already pointed out um, this very important visit last week. and. The discussion was that of a multi-dimensional partnership. Um, the development project number was clear, $400 million, um, plus a $50 million fund for fighting terrorism. But there is a large agenda right, for relations to be enhanced. Um, as an economist, for me, the upgraded economic relation, I think, is the really interesting part of this. You know, Given geography, and if you do a gravity model exercise, the trade potential is well below what should be there. Uh, you know, 4 billion, 5 billion trade is peanuts, given what can come. Uh, now, there are a number of issues. The bilateral trade deficit is there. Um, and, and really, one should be thinking much more about trying to address that uh, at a fundamental level in Sri Lanka, which means you know, boosting the competitiveness of Sri Lankan firms, uh, looking at the supply base, much better understanding of the South Indian market in particular, but also of Indian standards. So that becomes very, very important. Uh, as a mechanism. A second uh, very important storyline would be about tourism. We get um, the largest number of um, you know, tourists uh, into Sri Lanka is from India. Um, we have some 385,000 Indian tourists coming in. Uh, that number could easily double uh, without much effort. Uh, we could have a Ramayana trail in um, you know, India. We could have a Buddhist trail also as part of that. Um, and there is the huge unexploited potential of tourism in the north and east of Sri Lanka, uh, which offers a really interesting and different uh, tourism product. Um, so I think there's a very interesting uh, storyline there for tourism. And with the Maldives, you can have a very interesting trilateral cooperation for tourists from the United States and from Europe coming to this sub-region, uh, if it is marketed rightly. The kind of tourism that you get in the Mekong sub-region, you know, they have marketed that really well, that you have this uh, very clear division of labor, but also cooperative approach to marketing the entire sub-region. And I think that is something that South Asia could enjoy. FDI flows are very small. Uh, I gave you the number for China, 12 billion odd dollars. Indian number is something like a billion. Uh, Chinese investment, of course, mostly is in infrastructure. We don't get so much manufacturing yet, partly because of the constraints I underlined. So we have some homework to do on the Sri Lankan side uh, if we want to get the kind of FDI we want. The logistics hub, I think, is terribly important um, for Sri Lanka to be in the Indian Ocean. You know, a lot of the Colombo port's um, dynamism comes from the transshipment trade that we do f with India and for India. Uh, Two-thirds of Colombo port's uh, trade is transshipment and really oriented towards the Indian market. And what that really means is the big ships from outside the region and indeed from China come to Sri Lanka, they get unloaded, they put onto smaller ships and sent to Indian ports. And that's due to the turnaround times and port unloading efficiency of Colombo port. And that's what the large port operators value. Because in this business, in a global shipping industry that is in downturn, what matters is the competitiveness. And Indian ports are not yet there, although Sagamala will do a difference. Uh, the Sri Lankan port is still very efficient with the, two, with the four terminals that we have. Um, now, with that, we have to do some spillovers, and Indian investment plays a major role. The FTA, I think, is a very important area also. And I've mentioned already that the India-Sri Lanka agreement can be upgraded uh, through a much more systematic approach uh, with ECTA and also eventually taking the BIMSTEC agreement if there is traction there, but also the RCEP, which I think would be very important for South Asia to integrate into the value chains that might be unloaded out of East Asia, particularly China. As you know, Chinese um, outward investment rates are very, very high. They're going to Vietnam, they're coming a bit here and they're going to Indonesia. So China is, is partly going to its home area, and these are not just Chinese companies, but also US, Japan, uh, U companies which are unloading. The RCEP, which would provide common rules of origin, which would provide regional rules, uh, could be a very important mechanism for South Asia to mesh much more in this value chain. Um, so that's a very important area. 
for Sri Lanka, this port city, I think, is a, is a really interesting story. And, you know, I was skeptical, I must confess, as a development banker, thinking of this project, $11 billion investment over a long period of time, reclaiming land from the sea, etc. But I started looking at it much more detail-wise. And our institute is also doing a major study on the port city, trying to understand its potential. Um, you know, it, it has that amazing storyline. You know, Indian cities have an environmental issue, uh, which is very clear to this audience. You have a space capacity issue. Here is a brand new area a few miles off the coast that could be an impressive center if we get the right incentive and regulatory regime. Um, and relations will improve. Um, and, and it could be something quite fantastic, uh, potentially, uh, for both countries. Uh, and could create a new hub um, between Dubai and Singapore, which is a vision. Uh, and we're talking about something which, you know, is, is there for the next 20 years. You know, so this is a long-term investment. It could be very, very interesting. Um, beyond those issues, I think the people-to-people -people links are um, underdeveloped. Uh, we probably don't do enough of this. Not enough B2B links, um, uh, which are there. With Indian tourists coming up, maybe more Indian business people are coming to Sri Lanka. And that could be very valuable to spill over to much other links. Um, sports and media exchanges, I think, are very interesting. Creative uh, industries are another issue. I think the visa issues need to be looked at. Um, some sort of APEC business card type thing may be there um, as a proposal um, for, say, 250 Sri Lankans to come who are pre-selected. Uh, that would make a huge difference to some of these things. Um, then we have education and think tank opportunities. We don't do enough. Um, and the India Sri Lanka Foundation grant for us to come here was very, very nice. And one is going to try to encourage other Sri Lankan think tanks to be involved. And likewise, have uh, Indian scholars and think tanks to come to Sri Lanka to portray the Indian positions on things. And we have to reach better and more common grounds on many of the tricky issues, which I'm going to mention in a minute. Um, security issues are very important. Um, I think on intelligence, you know, one is very impressed by the Five Eyes proposal that, that is there amongst the advanced countries, United States, Australia, and others, Europe, uh, Britain is there. Uh, I think we should have much closer intelligence cooperation. The IS threat is real. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we were a victim of this uh, IS-inspired, shall we say, or, you know, it wasn't a directed operation. I think we uh, broadly can get that. Uh, but we need to work much more closely with India on the intelligence sharing uh, idea. Uh, which would be very important. And we are rebuilding our intelligence. Um, capacity building for our military would be very, very useful to get mutual understanding uh, on many issues. And then I think a rules-based maritime order would be interesting. Um, this is not hard law. You know, we're talking about soft law, uh, voluntary issues. Um, a code of conduct may be premature along the Djibouti conduct, which some people talk about as a role model. Shared understanding would be a very nice start. The, the international lawyers tell me that this is the way to go uh, on a voluntary basis. Um, so the Indian Ocean is then a zone of trade, but also, you know, has some tinges of a zone of peace, that proposal that was tried. Um, and I think it becomes a very interesting uh, storyline in a region and an era of great power competition. India, US, China issues are there, uh, but this could be a very uh, attractive area. Um, on the foreign relations uh, front, uh, there are many issues. Um, on China, of course, there have been Indian concerns, and, and, and those have been discussed, I'm sure, here last week, as well as bilaterally. Um, for Sri Lanka, I think we are trying to seek a commercial relationship with China, particularly to plug our infrastructure financing gap. You know, Sri Lanka needs something like $30 billion in infrastructure over a decade if we want to plug our infrastructure financing gap to create the kind of infrastructure that you need to achieve the aspiration of high-income status. That is our wish in Sri Lanka, right? And that number $30 billion comes from a kind of a bottom-up approach of assessing what our needs are going to be. If you want to spread the development out of Colombo and Gampaha, which are the urban conglomeration of Sri Lanka, out to the rest of the country, that's a big number. Um, we are going to need investment, and China has provided some of that. Others can also. Um, we have to make sure that that relationship does not spread into a security or a military storyline with China, and that is a really important issue. Um, and, you know, the kinds of things I've talked about, 
uh, could be very important for an India-Sri Lanka relationship if we manage it right down the future. Then there are, of course, you know, more sensitive issues, uh, which I'm not an expert and will not claim. The refugee issue is there. Um, there are something like 100,000 uh, refugees in South India, I understand. And the UNHCR has begun some kind of voluntary repatriation. And there is this big issue of repatriation versus local integration, which is very sensitive, of course. Um, if the repatriation is to be there, uh, from what little I've been reading about this, um, you know, there may have to be, you know, some um, issue of how you transport the belongings of some of these refugees uh, to Sri Lanka. Uh, there was some issue of some 60 kgs that can be transferred by UNHCR, if I got that right. I'm, I'm not an expert. I just try to understand the headlines. Um, and then there is the issue of, you know, some of the land of these people. Uh, Sri Lanka has promised to give some land back. Uh, and then livelihoods, you know, if people come back to a situation, if you look at refugees around the world, uh, people don't want to just go back there and be dependent on UNHCR or the handouts, they want a livelihood. And how do we create those jobs, you know? And the development approach that uh, President Gotabe has been talking about is a very important uh, building block uh, for Sri Lanka. Uh, but this refugee issue is very complicated. I, I will not pretend to understand the complexities of it. But all I understand as a development economist is Sri Lanka needs the overseas Sri Lankans and we need the skills that they can bring. And many of them may have developed business links with India, and that may be very useful uh, in going forward. Um, then the last point, uh, which is not in this, uh, is the Triaka arrangement, which I think we talked about. Um, and the Triaka, I think, is very important. Uh, we may want to do this again at a very trusted level, so that when there are you know, um, uh, fissures in the relationship, whatever they may be, uh, that these are you know, dealt with uh, you know, very quickly, so they don't spiral in any manner. Uh, and I think that would be very important. So in conclusion, and thank you very much for your indulgence, um, you know, history, culture, and economic geography bind India and Sri Lanka in a much closer way uh, than ever before. And the high-level visit, I think, was a very important juncture. But of course, the geopolitics has been challenging. Uh, and also, uh, we've had some legacy issues which have been difficult to deal with because of the sensitive nature of human relations. Uh, but, you know, over time, hopefully we can deal with these things. The summit, I think, was a very productive start. Um, you know, you had this uh, tagline, which was very interesting, about uh, two strong men uh, having a very nice conversation. And sometimes, you know, you achieve more that way. Uh, and, and so I'm hopeful, uh, but with national interests and, and, and also policies uh, in line. Um, we need a lot of very detailed uh, follow-up uh, at the working level. Uh, so there's a lot of homework. Uh, uh, for uh, the High Commissioner, of course, and the team in Colombo, and of course in India here, um, and, and to follow up on these detailed issues and try to find viable solutions. Um, I think think tanks, ICWA, uh, ourselves, and many others can play a very useful role in doing some studies. Uh, you know, we chart out the new reality. A lot of what I read um, in the literature in India, Sri Lanka, and, and the newspaper stuff is old stuff. And I think we can do more on the economic front as a way of kick-starting the relationship uh, with particularly also regional lens. I think we have to take a bigger picture. In a world that is perhaps closing and slowing, uh, India-Sri Lanka could be a new growth frontier. Uh, at least that's my dream as an economist. Um, but there are many, many risks, of course. Uh, but ultimately, I think you know, a good India-Sri Lanka relationship on the economic front in particular with the legacy issues being dealt with is good for both countries, but particularly for Sri Lanka, um, and could well be good for regional integration across South Asia. Um, thank you very much. Uh, some of the studies I talked about are here. Uh, please download them. Um, I, I try to remain current, uh, and I'm sort of thinking about how to flesh out a piece on India, Sri Lanka. So, so thank you so much. Thank you, Th thank you very much, Dr. Vignaraja, for that. Uh, lucid and thoughtful presentation for not only giving an overview of India-Sri Lanka relations, but also bringing out some salient, you no know, granular details. And moreover, you know, putting this relationship in context of five mega trends that you brought out, which influence